So far from the sky and land lectures, we have examined numerous sites around the world uh, and have learned about how the building of, say, astronomy science can bring both benefits and problems to the local uh, environment and communities. And we've also learned a bit about the history of how different groups, namely Western academia and indigenous groups, conceive, connect and relate to space. In this lecture, we ask the question, what rights do indigenous groups and scientific institutions have when it comes to land use? We will begin by exploring this topic uh, by situating ourselves in Australia again and consider the history of Indigenous land rights. As we have learnt numerous times throughout this course, the idea of terra nullis, meaning the land belongs to no one, has been used to deny Indigenous peoples of their land. In the 1980s, a Torres Strait Islander man named Eddie Marbo from Mare Island took the Queensland government to court to assert his rights over his country. In the court battle that lasted for 10 years, Mabo challenged the idea that Australia's rights to occupy these lands and asserted his own historical, cultural, spiritual and legal rights over his country. On the 3rd of June 1992, the High Court of Australia recognised the continuing connection and rights to the lands of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and rejected the idea that these lands were terra nullius prior to 1788. Following this ruling, in 1993, the Native Title Lands Rights Act was established which offered Indigenous groups the right to hunt, conduct ceremony and have a say over what development can occur on the land. In return, the Indigenous groups must be able to provide evidence of their ongoing continued connection to the land over which they claim. Further, it does not count for the privately owned land and any decisions made by Indigenous native title holders could be superseded by government intervention. Despite native title not providing exclusive rights to the land, it does provide Indigenous peoples the opportunity to have some say over their lands. So around the world, there are similar examples with Indigenous peoples estimated to have recognised ownership over about 11% of the entire world. <laughs> Uh, in the Philippines, for example, Indigenous communities can be granted the rights and ownership of their ancestral lands, uh, including the land, water and the resources. Land rights in India allow Indigenous peoples to access their land over which they have right, again, to their resources. In many developed countries, however, uh, they often use a mechanism called a treaty, which is a legally binding agreement between two or more parties. Uh, and this has largely been used to outline Indigenous land rights. So in Canada, close to about 100 treaties have been ratified and could potentially provide land ownership to specific Indigenous communities. In the United States, over 500 treaties offer the rights to land use for hunting, fishing, but by and large do not offer exclusive ownership rights. International law has its own decree when it comes to Indigenous land rights, which is outlined in the 2007 United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, or UNDRIP for short, and is the most comprehensive international instrument on the rights of Indigenous peoples. Adopted in 2007, the UNDRIP establishes a universal framework of the minimum standards for the survival, dignity and well-being of Indigenous peoples, and whilst it is not legally binding, it carries moral force. Specifically, Article 26 of the UNDRIP states that Indigenous peoples have the right to the lands, territories and resources with which they have traditionally occupied. So the legality of Indigenous land rights is complicated, to say the least, uh, and it's difficult to navigate for organisations or governments wanting to build facilities on Indigenous lands. However, there is a concept also called social licence to operate, and this refers to the set of behaviours and practices that are acceptable to a company or industry by its employees, stakeholders uh, and the general public. 
In the case studies we have examined so far, we have seen some instances where the social license uh, of some observatories have been brought into question by local communities, groups, indigenous communities, um, and in some cases, environmentalists. Irrespective of the unclear nature of indigenous land rights, it is vital to the success of any scientific endeavour to operate for the betterment of all, not just for some, in order to satisfy the social licence.